This is the last call to please sit down before the session ends. We know that we're going to have more folks coming in and saying, 
I have a higher and better use for this land to develop for something else, should we keep it in this designation? And on the one hand, you could say, well, let's, let's just let the market decide. That was a, something that was done in the mid-1960s. It, it's worked, but maybe today we don't really need as much of this land. We should just uh, let these other uses come in. But is that a good idea? Should we be setting aside these areas for these key industrial uses that I think everybody in the room knows are critical to the region's economy even if it's basically service-based, we still have to get the goods in and out of the region. So should we be keeping some of those areas? Now this isn't just a Bay Area conversation. This is something when I go and talk to postal managers around the country, they're all having the same discussion, the same debate. Does it make sense to keep these areas? Can we see the future and know that we don't need them? Or can we see the future and think we do need them? Uh, and I haven't heard any good answers yet. We have a seaport plan that the commission uses that works with the courts and is prepared by outside experts to evaluate the need for uh, seaport facilities in the region. And it's about time we did it. Uh, we, the last one we did was a while ago. We had this little international uh, meltdown. But now that things are picking up again, it's time to redo it again. But I think it's an open question as to how in this area where we're transforming our shoreline, do we want to look at how we reserve areas along the shoreline? And it's going to become even more important because of what Zach was talking about at lunch with living around a rising San Francisco Bay instead of a shrinking San Francisco Bay. Because we're going to also have to be protecting that infrastructure in our developed areas. And maybe we need to be thinking about this uh, more in, in, a, in an integrated fashion, which is one reason why we're calling for a regional strategy to address climate change and sea level rise around the bay. So with that setting the stage, I'm really interested in hearing the comments of my other speakers. So maybe we can answer the question. Hey, thank you, Steve. So now we'll turn it over to Jack Robertson from Lenar. Good afternoon. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, what I call the uh, five-hour energy panel. Um, very excited to uh, talk about our two projects, the Hunters Point Shipyard in San Francisco and Treasure Island in San Francisco. And uh, first, I, our two urban master plan communities that include residential, commercial, uh, retail, industrial, and a lot of open space. Uh, but first, just to co-opt the question, what's Oakland's role in my project? Um, <laughs> Oakland has a big role. We want as many Oakland residents to come across San Francisco and buy as many of our 20,000 homes as possible. Oakland businesses to move over to San Francisco and lease our retail and commercial space. And you can have a great view across the bay to Oakland. It'd be great. How's that for an answer? All right, I wouldn't do that. I'm a third generation Oaklander, so I'm on your side. So I'm just going to quickly run through both projects. Um, uh, this, what we call the shipyard. Uh, we pay the consultant ten thousand dollars to come up with that uh, branding exercise. <laughs> um, it's actually the shipyard Candlestick Point. They're two distinct neighborhoods. Uh, Candlestick, where uh, the 49ers play, is essentially the Candlestick Point area, um, and the shipyard is relegated to the Navy area. It uh, between the shipyard and Treasure Island, we have actually 14 miles of bay shoreline uh, to deal with, um, which we think is a huge asset for, for the, uh, the community. It, you, you never, I, never, I was astonished when I heard we had 14 miles. And, when, and it doesn't look like it, especially down in the Hunters Point Shipyard area. But when you go all the, see all the ins and outs that the slide, uh, the fog came in, so you can't see the slide. But um, all those big dry docks and the sawtooth uh, uh, coastline there. Uh, it's amazing. It's nine miles in the shipyard alone and uh, about six miles, I'll told, at Yerba Buena and Treasure Island. Um, but to take the shipyard, the basic development program there is, which we have entitled uh, after many years, is uh, about 12,000 homes, over 3 million square feet of uh, R&D commercial space that the city really hopes will become somewhat of a green tech campus, the way Mission Bay's become a biotech uh, center. 
Um, about a million square feet of retail, both neighborhood serving and then some more of a regional shopping center, which will be near the, where the Candlestick Stadium is right now. Uh, the shipyard has, uh, if you didn't know, the largest existing artist colony in the western United States currently. Um, they're all holed up in these uh, pretty derelict military barracks, but it sounds like the great life for a, an artist. Um, but one of the things we have to do is rebuild uh, their studios because all those barracks are coming down. So one of the first things we'll be doing is building a 250,000 square foot uh, studio space, both renovation and new. Uh, there'll be, all told, close to 300 artists uh, in residence there. Uh, we have a hotel planned um, and also an arena that could seat uh, maybe eight to 10,000 people. Um, the total shipyard council project's about 700, almost 800 acres and about 325 of those acres will be open space. Um, all the residential product, um, which is the big driver for the project, is attached housing. Um, unlike most of Lennar's uh, master plan communities we do out in the suburbs, these will all be uh, condos, townhomes, and um, high rises, mid rises, that type of product. Uh, and actually very similarly over at uh, Treasure Island. Um, so with regard to Treasure Island, it's about 450 acres, and we include Yerba Buena Island in there, except uh, for the uh, uh, southern half of Yerba, which is gonna be remain with the Coast Guard. That's been entitled for 8,000 homes, about a, a half a million square feet of retail, um, 100,000 square feet of office, another hotel, and of the 450 acres, about 300 acres of that will be remain as open space. Um, that will actually develop. It's not really that usable right now, uh, but we'll be putting in new parks and uh, wetlands and that sort of thing. And the, uh, we'll be developing a little bit of both uh, Yerba Buena Island and, and mostly the southwest, and southeast part of the main Treasure Island because that's where the soil is, is the best uh, shape. So where we are in these projects, um, they're fairly similar in, in uh, where their schedule is. The shipyard got approved. We got through a secret law lawsuit um, just a few months ago. So we're in the middle of uh, doing a lot of preparation for um, infrastructure planning. We hope this act, we ha do have a piece of the shipyard that the infrastructure is already in, the first phase that we started a couple of years ago. And we hope to actually break ground in the first units um, as early as this summer. Um, and then uh, Treasure Island is probably sometime, hopefully next year, We'll get some uh, land transferred to us from the Navy, um, which controls most of, most of the land still in both uh, projects, and they're cleaning it up as we speak here. Um, and then we hope to uh, uh, get started on that project too. Both of these are about uh, 15 to 20 year build outs. So that's the two projects in a nutshell. Okay, thank you, Jack. Now, Bill. Thanks very much, and, and uh, I'd like to thank Bay Planning Co uh, Coalition for including me on this panel, and, and it also gives me a chance to congratulate Will Travis on his uh, well-deserved award. He's been a, a friend to Richmond for many years, and, and uh, gives me a chance to, to thank him for that. Um, the, uh, the, the title for this panel is Sustainable Compatibility, and, and I really do feel like that's what we're trying, that's how we're trying to approach our planning in the in the city of Richmond um, and uh, our planning does I think reflect diverse land uses along the shoreline that really does acknowledge the the gifts that are brought to us by by uh, being on San Francisco Bay and there are um, three projects that I wanted to talk about that really sort of exemplify uh, uh, some of the things that are going on in in Richmond it really is kind of an exciting time and, and frequently referred to as a Richmond Renaissance, which I, I love to hear and I think really is happening, um, involving not only the shoreline but also in our downtown area. And believe me, one, one affects the other. There's no question about it that, that, uh, um, that everything in planning seems to be very closely tied together. The first project I wanted to talk about is the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Back in uh, January, after about a one-year formal search process, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab announced that the University of California Richmond Field Station in the city of Richmond is the preferred site for their second campus. 
which they're now starting to refer to as the Bay Campus, uh, as opposed to uh, the Hill Campus. So they have their Hill Campus and their Bay Campus. Um, I'd rather have them call it the Richmond Shoreline Campus, um, but maybe if we had a $20,000 marketing consultant, we could convince them to, to change the name. The, uh, the uh, planning for the, um, the Bay Campus is already underway. In fact, we are meeting with, with uh, the project manager already. Uh, every couple of weeks, we do a planning meeting. Their, their schedule is um, to do the planning over the next several years with the hope that in approximately 2016, they can do the ribbon cutting and complete the first phase, which is a, when you first hear about it, it sounds like, well for me anyway, uh, it sounds like a long ways off, uh, um, 2016, four years from now, and then when you actually sit down and look at all the things that need to be done in terms of getting the entitlements, doing the planning, doing the detailed architecture, um, all the, all the uh, um, community process that will be necessary to do this long-range development plan, it, it, actually, it actually is going pretty fast, and, and uh, they, they've hit the ground running. Um, they have made some commitments as a, just as being a member of the community, they they've, uh, are making some commitments that are really important to, to the city of Richmond in terms of how they uh, not only achieve their science mission, but also a broader community mission, social mission, in terms of how it can touch the Richmond community. And they've been, they've been really great to work with so far, and, and I expect that to continue. The first phase of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is uh, about 400,000 square feet of laboratory space and uh, about 800 employees coming to the Richmond Field Station. What that, uh, what that does uh, primarily, however, is consolidate lab space that they have in uh, Walnut Creek and Emeryville and, uh, and another site as well. Um, so the initial phase is to bring those, those scientists together in one location. And the, um, the philosophy of the, of the lab, and it goes back to uh, uh, Lawrence, uh, Dr. Lawrence, the founder, was that scientists work better in terms of doing research. They work more effectively, they, be, they are more creative if they work together and if they're in one place. And so uh, this is something that, that they want to achieve with their existing lab um, uh, laboratories in these other sites in the Bay Area with their first phase, about 400,000 square feet. At uh, build out, and what they'll be planning for in their long range development plan is about 2 million square feet. So, uh, and that absorption is uh, perhaps over a 20 to 30 year period. Um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, just uh, to, for those of you who don't know, is a Department of Energy facility. So even though it has a strong connection with UC Berkeley, and UC Berkeley in fact owns the, the, um, the Richmond Field Station, um, they're, they're almost like a separate campus within the University of California system that is a Department of Energy site. So the institutional relationships are, are kind of interesting and it was important for us to understand as we uh, promoted Richmond as a site for, uh, for the laboratory. But um, really, if, if all the lab brought was, um, was two million square feet of lab space uh, on the other side of the fence, um, that would be a real disappointment, I think, and, and um, it wouldn't have the synergistic effect that we think it will have in the city of Richmond. And in fact, this is one of the things that the, the lab has said they're looking forward to, is not just being a uh, sort of a closed campus, but one that is that is open, that allows public access, that has a street get grid uh, that goes through it and connects to the community. And so, what we're engaged in right now is broader land use planning that looks at the adjacent sites. We just adopted our uh, a general plan this last Tuesday night that reflects that, that reflects the the uh, potential for a a Mission Bay type of of development that includes both. Um, uh, the, the, the public uh, lab space, Department of Energy, but also private lab space, and all the different types of supporting uh, businesses, supporting facilities that uh, support uh, the, the type of employment center that it seeks to become. So um, we think that uh, we're off to a, a real good start, and, and um, I, I, I'm looking forward to 
working with them on this and eventually, uh, hopefully, cutting a ribbon in 2016. And, um, and, and at some point, just kind of walking on the campus and enjoying the atmosphere. The uh, next project I wanted to talk about is um, that, that represents sort of our sustainable compatibility is the, the um, Ford assembly plant renovation that was done by Ord Development Company. Um, this is another site right on San Francisco Bay. Uh, the, uh, the Ford assembly plant was constructed in the 1930s, uh, produced Fords, uh, and then during World War II, it, it became, uh, it produced, uh, I think, tanks and jeeps that were um, loaded onto ships and, and uh, went overseas as part of Richmond being a uh, part of the, the home front industrial effort. Uh, this was a, uh, a real wreck. It got uh, the, the building. You wouldn't know it now. I should have used a before and after picture that you can't see anyway. Um, but uh, but it, it was uh, had a lot of broken windows. It sustained a lot of seismic damage in the Loma Prieta earthquake. And uh, with some help of um, uh, FEMA money and also with our redevelopment agency, we were able to, uh, to help um, catalyze the development. The Orton Development Company uh, approached it, I think, in a very creative way. That they um, redid, they, they did the seismic upgrade to the building. They brought in some good tenants. It's now anchored by SunPower. And uh, they've, uh, again, they, they are really almost, I, I believe, almost fully leased on their 500,000 square feet of space. But there are another couple of, of real special elements of this that beyond it just being an office building. Um, the first thing is that it will be the site for the, um, the visitor center for the, the Rosie the Riveter um, National Historic Park. And uh, you, you hear perhaps a lot about the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, but the city of Richmond has its own National Park, uh, Rose of the River National Park, which commemorates the, the home front effort, um, not just of Richmond, but of all the different cities um, throughout, throughout the country. Um, it, it, I would encourage you, if nothing else, to, to go and, and look at the Rose of the River um, Monument, which is, which is near there, and just read about some of the, the many things that happened and, and how Richmond was, was at one point the seat of a lot of social change in, in terms of labor. Um, it, it's really a very interesting history. But um, as part of the development, Orton is constructing the visitor center. Uh, the grand opening of that will be in May. Um, so just in a couple of months, so, so watch for that coming up. That's uh, an exciting event. And uh, the other thing that has come up very recently is uh, uh, the, the um, next to the Craneway, which the Craneway borders the, the bay, which is a, um, it's an entertainment and convention uh, or conference center venue, again, right on, uh, right on the, the shore there. And there's a dock adjacent to that, and what uh, Mr. Warden has done is he's offered that site, uh, that dock, to be used potentially by the, the Water Emergency Transit, uh, Transit Authority as a ferry terminal. Uh, makes a great site. The um, WIDA was, was analyzing that area um, anyway and had plans to, to build a ferry terminal. I think that would probably still be in their long-term plans. But in the short term, all we need, is, all we need are boats and uh, ferry service could start in Richmond right away. And that's something that we, we really are trying to encourage WIDA to undertake quickly um, to get um, more, uh, more traffic on the roads and more onto the water. Um, supporting uh, maritime use of the, of the bay. The um, third project I wanted to talk about um, is the Port of Richmond. And the uh, Port of Richmond is uh, represented here today by Jim Azorkas, the Port Director, who's also on the BPC's uh, Board of Directors, and also Lucy Zhu, who's on the, the Port staff. And um, under Jim's leadership, they've done a, a very good job making investments in the infrastructure that, um, that can handle uh, primarily auto. It's auto logistics. Uh, we were able to finance the, the uh, investment in that infrastructure with a 15-year contract with Honda to bring uh, vehicles through the Port of Richmond. There's a guaranteed minimum that they bring in and uh, that they pay for anyway. They don't have to bring it in, but they have to pay us for it. 
and um, that was a lot, that allowed us to secure the bond and indebtedness to make that infrastructure. Um, with that auto handling infrastructure in place, uh, we uh, recently, last year, I believe it was, uh, also got a contract with Subaru to bring vehicles in through the Port of Richmond. I'm, I'm the proud owner of a, uh, of a Honda that came through the Port of Richmond. It says so right on the little tag, um, which is nice to, nice to have. The, um, so we're looking to expand that uh, and looking uh, to expand business opportunities. Uh, Jim is constantly working on that. I'm, he, he, I'm not going to go into detail because he, he likes to play uh, his marketing cards co uh, close to the best. So, um, but he certainly is doing a great job getting the port out there and, uh, and looking at it, it places where we can expand our, um, our revenues that, that flow to the city, but also um, so that it has, so that it can really fulfill its job potential. So that's what I would describe as sustainable compatibility, just wrapped up in those three projects. We have a, um, a campus that we think uh, will inspire interaction, collaboration, innovation, and invention just by its very location. Um, we have an employment center that also includes a national park and a visitor center and uh, perhaps a ferry terminal. And then we also have a, a very active port that's looking to expand its, its um, business and its impact on the local economy. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Joanne. Okay, while well, the microphone's making its way down to Phil, I just want to add uh, that we've roasted the Riveter of World War II Full Front National Historic Park Visitor Center. Then I worked on that project on behalf of the National Park Service, and it was a very complicated project. Um, it was a public-private partnership between the city of Richmond, who was indispensable, Eddie Orton's uh, important development company, and the National Park Service that involved uh, it involved historic tax credits as well as new market tax credits. So if anybody's interested in talking about that, I'll be happy to. The actual opening is May 26th, Memorial Weekend. Okay, with that, Bill. Well, <clears throat> what you've he heard here today, I guess, is a, a collection of advanced citizens uh, involved in, I think, projects that mean a lot to the Bay. and. Uh, we're, we're definitely trying to do our part here in Oakland. Um, my name is Phil Tagami. I'm the uh, president and CEO of California Capital Investment Group. And we went through a process with the city of Oakland and the port of Oakland about 42 months ago to be selected as the master developer for the infrastructure and the build out of the fo former Oakland Army Base. Uh, currently, we are in an exclusive negotiating agreement with the city of Oakland and working very collaboratively with the port of Oakland uh, that is pursuing uh, elements of what was included in the master plan independently, but uh, in collaboration with the city and with ourselves. Uh, the project is roughly 366 acres. Uh, of that 366 acres, roughly uh, 61 acres has been dedicated for a future intermodal rail facility we'd like to refer to just as a uh, unit train rail facility. Uh, our primary function uh, has been to go out and identify the site constraints, uh, look for solutions, put a cost to those solutions, help identify the funding to cover the infrastructure costs, and then place private capital uh, to handle vertical development for a new uh, trade and logistics district for Oakland, in essence, uh, to really preserve the tradition of a working waterfront on the working side of the bay, and focus on providing good quality jobs for our community and help drive the Northern California mega regions economy, not only with good import opportunities, but with good export opportunities for uh, not only agricultural product and frozen food, uh, but also the types of commodity. The Port of Oakland is really focused on the containerized side of the activity, and a lot of what we're trying to introduce is some of the break bulk and manifest activities, and a lot of the private development will be rail served facility for uh, cold and refrigerated storage, transload and deconsolidation facilities, as well as purpose-built facilities to handle bulk and oversized products that need to get around the bay. So being on a, a heavyweight corridor, being rail served and having deep water access, I think are pretty special things that we're pretty excited to be a part of. A little history is that this was really built as a trade logistics facility to support the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and it was decommissioned in 1999, 
and, and transferred to the city through an economic development conveyance in 2003 and through the Reversionary Act rights to the state of California and then directly to the Port of Oakland. And the city has struggled over the years with how we would approach this. And one of the challenges was everyone wanted to be focused on vertical development and what the end use would be. And no one wanted to really dig in and spend the time, energy, and money to solve the infrastructure, which is really not the fun stuff. The interesting thing is that because the property had been in continuous use as uh, under a lease furtherance of conveyance and then under uh, an economic development conveyance uh, with a reinvestment act obligation, uh, no one really wanted to bite the bullet and, and um, cut off the flow of revenue that they collect from interim uses. And so one of the great challenges there is introducing the notion of uh, making the omelet and breaking the eggs by saying that you need to deconstruct buildings and you need to get to the infrastructure that's below grade uh, and bring it up to a modern standard. Well, things have changed since 1941. And uh, there are a lot of rules that apply, and uh, there are a lot of systems that we need to bring into the vanguard of uh, modern society that support those jobs that we're trying to attract. So we've uh, gone through a very patient process, and we've just concluded a master plan which uh, details uh, power, sewer, stormwater, um, telephony, uh, basically the roads, uh, and, and, and domestic water as well as reused, recycled water systems to really create a, a site that's ready to receive vertical development and uh, again introduce, uh, we think, a very important part of Oakland's future, which is uh, enhanced rail service. To do that, we can't go to the railroads and simply say, hey, we're going to put a rail yard here. We need to communicate with the class one railroads to make sure they know that there are customers that have specific commodities and commodity types that want to commit to Oakland as a port and commit to facilities that will build to handle those materials and keep the system moving. Um, many people don't realize that the, the, the cargo has to come from somewhere and has to go somewhere and that the railroads have to keep all that other cargo moving on its schedule as well. So we need to be able to have our future customers talk directly with the railroads and really get commitments and understand the kind of service level they require and frequency of service and then we can work through a very well established process the class one railroads have of being able to establish that service for our community ensuring that on a very congested corridor which is what we have right here uh, that we're able to provide customers the right rate and service and also promote safety. What's fun about this project is it does a number of things that I think we've all set out regionally to do which is promote the economy to improve the environment, to reduce congestion, uh, and go about that in a very thoughtful manner. Uh, the, the largest source of funding right now identified for this project is Prop 1B trade quarter improvement funds, and $242 million was awarded to the Port of Oakland to accomplish this project. And, uh, and along with a lot of challenges that many government and quasi-government agencies face, the Port is looking for the most thoughtful and appropriate way to get that match to accomplish this mission. So we've undertaken with the City of Oakland as private partners as well as with others involved uh, funding that match to allow and unlock the potential of this grant to reach the objectives and prove the value and benefit that was intended when the grant was originally sought a few years back. So the first phase of our project is roughly $484 million. The master plan, if we were to do everything that our hearts uh, desired, would put probably closer to a billion dollars worth of work and again, that would take a number of years to realize because there are a number of challenges with funding public infrastructure. We do not propose to own the land. Uh, the city has desired us to lease the land, so we'll be taking down a long-term lease for the city of Oakland. Uh, we're in the middle of wrapping up an agreement that's referred to as a lease disposition and development agreement. We're also just in the final stages of wrapping up a CEQA document that is an addendum to the 2002 EIR. And uh, we've really been very patient and, and diligent in making sure that we are working well within the, the, the limits of that 2002 environmental document. And of course, had to be thoughtful reconciling AB 32 and SB 375 along the way to make sure that uh, as we look at air quality, infill building, uh, and a number of other factors that we're, we're sensitive to those things. So we're excited that the city council will hopefully be uh, poised in uh, late May, early June to not only adopt the CEQA uh, document to approve, ratify the lease disposition and development agreement 
and a series of other actions required to allow this project to be under construction uh, in late uh, 2013. We had targeted a construction start date for June of 2013 uh, and still think that there are some elements of this project that we will want to get underway. Uh, one of the big things we have to do with this site, and you've heard a little bit about sea level rise today, is not only do we have to address the sea level rise issue for a long term, but we need to also address the fact that this site is loosely consolidated sands and fill on top of Young Bay mud. And if we want to really rely on the infrastructure we're going to put there, we're going to need to do a little surcharge, a little wicking, and a little dynamic compaction. So we'll probably be importing for the city portions of the project somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.4 million cubic yards of material. A lot of that will be coming in by barge and hopefully by rail. Uh, we want to minimize truck traffic into the community. If we did it all by truck, you'd be looking at roughly 170,000 truckloads of dirt. So I don't think that would be a very popular move. Um, and then that material, of course, has to be placed and has to be surcharged. And you know we have to deal with the water that comes out of the ground. And then, of course, we have a little bit of a cut to get down to a finished grade. And that's going to take some time. Uh, the rail facilities, we look at a little differently. The Port of Oakland will be taking the lead on taking our design the rest of the way, finishing that design and delivering those rail facilities. But we'll be working very closely together on that and a uh, very competent team of people have been pulled together uh, through the port process as well as people we've had involved to collaborate and make sure that that facility will not only serve the customer but be delivered. So uh, we're very excited for the opportunity uh, to, to be involved and uh, really see this as part of uh, Oakland's future, a working waterfront. The good paying jobs are important. Um, the uh, West Gateway uh, is a natural facility to uh, handle this oversized and bulk activity. Again, not a primary port activity because they do mostly containerization, but very good jobs. And our brothers and sisters at the ILWU would be prepared to step there and fulfill what was once under the PNA contract. Again, that type of activity out of the Outer Harbor. And um, we see a lot of demand for that work and a community that's ready to go to work and take advantage of the opportunity. On the warehousing side, uh, we have a joint venture partner on the warehousing, which is ProLogis, uh, which is the uh, leading trade logistics facilities provider in the world, operating in over uh, 60, uh, 60 markets in uh, 41 countries. And their headquarters, global headquarters, is right there in San Francisco. So their CEO, Mr. Mogadon, likes to look at uh, from Pier 1 and wants to know that he can see his logo sitting there in the city of Oakland uh, and they can uh, house a lot of their 5,200 customers uh, right across the bay. So we want to take advantage of that universe, that market, uh, to help not only move boxes to the port of Oakland, but support a lot of other business that we think we can attract to this area. Uh, I think that uh, lastly, uh, not really lastly, because there are a lot of things we can talk about when we talk about projects of, of this nature, but um, our relationship to the water is important, and we need to be sensitive of that relationship. Uh, I think the, the language, and I'll probably botch it somewhat, but the language that really is driving for BCDC is to promote um, access to the waterfront, maximum access to the waterfront that's you know possible or reasonable to achieve. And I think I probably bungled it somewhat, but the, the same consistent, with the consistent with the project. Very good. Thank you. You're here to save me. I sat in the right seat. So, uh, I have a purpose. And so the goal with that really is to look at how we can be thoughtful. If, in fact, we don't have people calling on the facilities, uh, some of the BCDC team and Brad McCray came up with a really thoughtful suggestion that's very similar to what they do in San Francisco is can we, in fact, find a secure way to provide access to the public if, in fact, the, the war for dock is being used to maximize what the public's access and relationship to the water is. So, you know, with limitations and trying to find a constructive way forward, those are the kinds of ideas that we need to be open to looking for a way to solve. Um, but along that dialogue, it's also, as a voter who commutes on San Francisco Bay three or four days a week, I look at it and say, we also want to make sure that some of the use and activity in the water out there shouldn't be uh, adverse to uh, the commercial side of what's happening in the water. And there are other areas and opportunities where we need to encourage uh, recreational boating and kayaking, uh, not necessarily in the main, main thoroughfare where we have a lot of tugs operating a lot of container vessels that don't quite stop on a dime. So uh, that's the kind of communication and collaboration I think that's important. No one gets these projects done, the projects you heard here today, the project I've described, no one gets that stuff done in isolation. 
Uh, it would be fun if we could do that for, you know, invoke Robert Moses from the, the early 1920s and just do exactly what we wanted to do without having uh, William Edelstein or anyone else standing in our way. But the world's not that way today. So we have to build these relationships and these collaborations and look for solutions and find our way uh, forward together. But I think there are a lot of people, we have to remember that a lot of people are counting on us to deliver and put uh, this country and our communities back to work uh, in good paying jobs and do it without uh, too much dithering and uh, hesitation. So with that, thank you. This is development easy here in the Bay Area. <laughs> so it sounds like we've got everyone who live in uh, Jack's project, they would be working over in the city of Richmond, driving cars in the city of Richmond, and perhaps working in, in Phil's project, and Phil's project is making all the goods that everybody needs and then they come back to Richmond to go to the visitor center, and meanwhile, BCDC is trying to plan for all of this. Did I get that right? <laughs> That's sustainable compatibility. Okay, so uh, we've actually answered some of these questions, but I'll try to field them again. So, how has your projects or your work affected the current maritime industry in the Bay, and vice versa? Um, I, I don't think our two projects have uh, had much impact. I mean, Treasure Island really didn't have a lot of maritime activity. It was a Navy uh, base. It was not really a shipping uh, location. It was primarily administrative, some processing, um, and except for the Coast Guard, which we're not really uh, touching. The one thing that did come up in planning for Treasure Island with the Coast Guard was uh, making sure we didn't plan our community in such a way that would interview, interfere with their uh, vessel traffic uh, serv service. Um, so with a lot of our um, uh, high, taller buildings that we uh, have approved, uh, there's a possibility that we could interfere with some of their radar for out on the bay uh, traffic. So we, we, worked, we met with the Coast Guard and, and worked out a, a protocol where certain buildings at certain locations, if they go above a certain height, um, we would consult with the Coast Guard and if necessary, um, relocate some of that radar on top of our buildings or in a new location on your Mabuena or uh, adjust the location of the building so it wouldn't have any impact. At the shipyard, um, again, since we've been involved, I mean, the Hunters Point shipyard has been uh, vacant for decades now, more or less. The shipping activity hasn't, uh, and most any type of significant maritime activity hasn't really occurred there. Um, so we think what we're doing with both these projects is really hopefully increasing some of the uh, maritime uses. uses. Uh, we'll be adding a ferry terminal at Treasure Island. Um, uh, we'll be expanding the sailing center there. Uh, at the shipyard, we'll uh, potentially be adding another ferry terminal and, and just bringing uh, shoreline access that, to two areas that really doesn't, especially at the shipyard, really doesn't have public access right now. And now uh, when that project gets done, it will have uh, public access right up to the bay shore. I don't really see that um, <clears throat> we have that much of an impact. What's kind of interesting about our project is it's always been what we're going to make it. Um, so interesting enough, uh, after the military commission, I think uh, the maritime industry, uh, port and others, were able to make good use of a lot of this uh, the wharfs and fenders and, and keep uh, maritime activity there supporting uh, you know, our, our, our economy, West Coast activity, especially uh, the balance trade that we see at the port, both import and export. Um, so outside of that, I think as we go into the future, if anything, there will be more certainty and better stewardship to make sure that uh, the activity, at least on our watch, will be uh, something that I think everyone can be proud of. And just real briefly, we're we're uh, we're looking to have more impact on on um, the maritime industry in the Bay Area, especially through um, hopefully expanded um, expanded operations at the port, and um, and then also with the with the ferry service. Um, the, the um, you know, I, I think that it, it's it's such an asset for for goods movement and recreation and people movement and everything else that that um, that and, and our planning, what we're trying to do really tries to, to recognize that and, and capture those benefits as um, as just just uh, um, really important intrinsic parts of the projects we're doing.
future development compatible with current and potential maritime industry? We may have actually answered that in the way I think. Let's go to the next one. So we want to get better. Yeah? Okay, that's right. So what major infrastructure will be necessary in the future? Well, that, that's a snowball right up the middle. With sea level rise, we're going to need major infrastructure uh, to deal with that. Our maritime ports, many of which uh, maybe already have their facilities high enough to offload equipment, but they're saying the intermodal rail, getting those goods off uh, the docks and off to the rest of the country is at risk. And as we look at these projects, we need to do integrated planning to make sure that we are uh, both both building some resilience and also planning for future resilience. And I think, particularly, uh, if you talk a little bit about the project at Treasure Island, I think there, you guys are already thinking about this and doing some pretty innovative approaches to deal with it. Um, right, we have about, uh, at Treasure Island, about one and a half billion dollars of infrastructure we'll be putting in there. Um, and a lot of that is the typical road, street, sewers, um, all that sort of thing. But also we have a lot of compaction we got to do out there in the uh, day one. Um, and as far as sea level rise, we're uh, putting uh, essentially all our, we have made significant setbacks from the uh, bay line before there's any actual development. Um, and those setbacks will have burnt, will be burned up um, and be park space essentially. And, and it's, such, it's a, basically an adaptive management approach uh, that will raise the um, building pad levels to I think about three and a half feet above the uh, base flood elevation. So hopefully um, you know, we're planning over time to be able to address a 55 inch um, rise in sea level, but not from day one. Uh, but with those setbacks, we think we could uh, uh, manage through that. We have a seven foot, um, you know, from medium, medium high tide, we're about seven feet at our lowest point. And then, again, just due to our uh, differential settlement that's occurred over time, we'll be adding two feet. And so, in essence, from one view of the world, you can say we've planned for a 16 inch innovation uh, and solve for that. Uh, ultimately, you know, when you look at our, our f final grade and finished elevation, its relationship with the railroad, uh, that's very, very important. And again, the natural uh, protection of the from the work we're doing uh, will protect it in that location, but again, we have to look at the bay as a whole. So, uh, you know, we'll just refer to it as uh, Oakland Island at some point. I guess. And just a couple of, of uh, types of infrastructure I didn't touch on that I wanted to mention. One is, uh, one is rail. We, we, um, Actually, most of our most of the impacts of rail for us uh, from the maritime industry are from the port of Oakland, and um, as as the, the rail lines go through Richmond, and and um, we I, I think there from from our perspective um, there needs to be a, a well planned uh, and thoughtful investment in the in the rail infrastructure uh, to deal with with these. Uh, these transportation centers like the Port of Oakland or like the Port of Richmond. Uh, we need great separations. In some cases, the, the uh, uh, railroads like Union Pacific and, and BNSF need to uh, uh, tie together so that they can single track where there are great separations and, and don't have disruptions on, um, on, the, uh, on our population that, that begins then to start to rent, resent the projects uh, and resent the economic development that, that happens as a result. So that's one thing. And then the other thing, quite simply, is is uh, the Bay Trail infrastructure. I, I think I think um, I think it's correct that that um, Richmond may have the most uh, mileage of, of uh, Bay Trail now of, of uh, cities in the Bay Area. Uh, that's a real um, that's a real important recreational amenity. And looking to the future, it, it actually, when you talk to folks uh, at, at SunPower um, coming over on the ferry and you, you, you talk to students that are at the Richmond Field Station now, which will be the part of LBNL, they really see that as uh, a way to get to and from work um, from, from Berkeley or, or other, par uh, other parts of, of um, that, uh, that area there. So that, I think, is an important piece of infrastructure to invest in. 
that 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 point it's gonna I think that point is a very important point. And here in Alameda County, uh, a lot of our elected officials have come together through uh, ACTC, Alameda County Transportation Commission, and have uh, put on the ballot for November a half cent sales tax, plus an, ex an additional half cent, which will go into perpetuity, which is roughly $7.7 .7 billion in the next 20 years for vital infrastructure uh, for our community. So literally keeping people moving, uh, keeping, uh, the, you know, addressing some of these decongestion issues, putting money into AC Transit, putting money into Bart to Livermore, a very important infrastructure, helping the Port of Oakland realize some of its vision with the 7th Street Great Separation Project, and a number and a host of other things. So, if you're uh, here doing business in Alameda County, if you're a contractor, if you're in the shipping logistics business, or if you're a designer, we'll be calling to look for your contribution for uh, B3. I think it's the only way forward in the future. Uh, I don't want to say diminishing supremacies at home and abroad, but from a you know when we have Congress debating if uh, they're going to break a tradition we've had here since 1932 by getting rid of gas tax uh, on the federal level, and that's really a conversation, and we have difficulty with surface transportation reauthorization. We have to really be real. We have to be creative and have a new dialogue and a new vernacular of how we're going to fund infrastructure and transportation. And um, so we either have to sell mobility, and then it's more privatization, uh, which can be a little creepy, because it's long-term putting the public safety and mobility into private hands, or we just have to come to grips and educate people that it's not free to get around. And so those are some of the great challenges I think we're going to face here in California and as a country. Just real briefly again on, on uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. They, they have been uh, uh, really very interested in uh, public-private partnerships in a, a sort of an unusual way. Again, um, having their, their actual campus be a mixture of some private, some public labs um, where, again, they, 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 they see the science as being synergistic regardless of whether it's public, public research or, or private research. And um, in terms of, of uh, us working with them and working with private developers that are seeking to direct or, or develop around the site, th that'll also be really important. The lab folks in their search, they, you know, they, they were very candid about the fact that they do science very well, they do research very well, but they don't know how to do development. And so they really will be relying on, on um, Private developers, private development expertise, and to a certain, and I think to a great extent, um, our city to, to help them um, achieve their vision. Um, yes, we, we are we're definitely relying on our two projects on the, the locality, the city, the agency successor, uh, whatever it is uh, now, to uh, help us in a partnership. I mean, we have four and a half mil billion dollars worth of financing. Uh, infrastructure uh, work to do, and about a third of that, about one and a half billion dollars, is, is uh, expected to come from bond financing, uh, from some form of infra infrastructure financing district or uh, tax increment financing. We lead right into the next question, and that is uh, as the demise of redevelopment agencies in California, has the potential to undermine the state of California had an effect on your projects? When you said successor agency, I think that's what you're referring to. Right, I, I can start that one, I, I suppose. Uh, yes, there was some uh, uh, nail biting over the last year or so when we were going through our approvals uh, for these projects. Um, Treasure Island had its own redevelopment authority, the Treasure Island Development Authority, um, which had full redevelopment powers separate from the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency. Um, when uh, this, the picture started clarifying what was going to happen with agencies, we got very nervous. So before we got our approvals, we switched from a redevelopment agency structure to an infrastructure financing district, um, which wasn't as lucrative as far as the ability to issue bonds and the amount of bonds that could be raised for our financing. Um, and it had some impact on the amount of affordable housing we could deliver. So um, we had um, tried to speak up there. There comes your train, Phil.
Uh, we had, for example, at Treasure Island, we had 30% affordable housing. It was the amount of the total housing out there. So now we're down to 25% just because the funding sources for that dried up somewhat. Uh, we hope to maybe amend the state legislation for IFDs, at least for Treasure Island, so we can get back up to 30. But right now we're at 25%. And um, at the shipyard, it was, it, we expect to be okay there. We were approved uh, before the state um, uh, acted, the legislature acted to terminate agencies. It's still a little uh, dicey in terms of understanding how these successor agencies come into play. Um, essentially, the legislation really was to terminate agencies and to wind down the existing ones. So some have already shut their doors, uh, and the rest are supposed to be kind of winding down. Uh, I don't think uh, Sacramento contemplated our situation when they were thinking this through, because we, we're essentially going to be winding down a 20-year project that's just starting up. So, um, and then they acknowledge that, but we've got to kind of work through some of the quirks of uh, that uh, structure right now. I, I think that uh, I share a lot of what uh, has been said, but I, I want to add that we had never underwritten this county and redevelopment. Uh, it, the need in the West Oakland community is so significant that uh, we didn't think it was appropriate when we were responding to the RFQ, RFP, that we would count on or plan on using uh, any of the increment for the project. Um, the, the unintended consequence of redevelopment going away is redevelopment law didn't go away. And um, so that's kind of a sticky wicket. And then the complexity of the fact that it was a, uh, a economic development conveyance with an ongoing obligation, with a Reinvestment Act obligation, at first was a complication that we were a little frustrated with, but it turns out to be kind of a saving grace in that uh, that is the enforceable obligation uh, that I think is easy for not only the um, oversight committee locally to look at, but also for the Department of Finance to be able to reconcile. So the question really kind of going forward though as we look at it is, um, will legislation that's being contemplated right now in Sacramento provide new tools that need to be used and how do we then leverage those new tools not only to help a project like ours and Treasure Island and others realize their infrastructure, but realize that we also have to have a other kind of benefit, and you can literally say a community benefit, that levers up not only our four corners, but reaches into the community and provides um, uh, a hand up and to help those neighboring communities reach some of the potential as well. I thought there were a lot of things that needed to be changed about redevelopment, and um, a lot of project areas could be shrunk, or, or uh, in, some, in some jurisdictions, you, you could get rid of them entirely, and it wouldn't have that much effect uh, except it would give the state more revenue. Um, using that approach, I think, uh, would have made some sense to, to really look at what needed to be reformed in, in redevelopment. And um, instead, you know, the phrase I've used before is that the state decided to euthanize a patient that had a curable disease. They, um, you know, it was, it was like they threw up their hands saying, well, it's, it's too hard for us to work together, so let's just kill the whole thing. And um, and I think, it, I think that uh, it will have an effect on what we do, have effect on how we, we um, finance infrastructure for LDNL, uh, that uh, it will have a, a detrimental effect on that. It'll certainly have a de detrimental effect in our downtown area, but, but that's obviously not the topic of this. Um, but but it, will, it will be a, a problem. And uh, I mentioned uh, the Ford Assembly Plant. And I mentioned that that was done with a partnership with our redevelopment agency. Um, I think it would have either been torn down or would still be a, a, uh, a broken window farm if, um, if we didn't have redevelopment to, to actually help get that project done. Um, and just one little piece of irony I'll pass along. Um, I got an email just the other day from a legislative assistant for a legislator who, who voted against who, who, who voted to put redevelopment out of business. And um, it related to the fact that, that our redevelopment director um, left some several months ago to take another job. Um, it wasn't because uh, we, we, were, we were shutting it down that soon, but he left to take another job. And um, so his question was, um, 
have you have you hired a, a another uh, or a replacement redevelopment director uh, to take place of the person who left because we need a point of contact and so uh, I sent I sent him an unlisted or not an unlisted I sent him a disconnected phone number and I said you know use that as your uh, use that as your contact I, I don't know if he's found out that yet um, <laughs> so he tries to dial it he'll he's going to get a recording and um, and that'll that'll be my Probably not the last laugh, but it, it allowed me to, to laugh a little bit when I hit the send button. Oh, and by the way, we're doing infrastructure with respect to quiet zones also. Since there's no one here from the state of California, I feel that I'm just obligated to have to respond. I think that uh, the, there was a patient, and the patient did have a curable disease, but unfortunately it was called addiction. And you know, when, when the patient kept breaking into your house and stealing the TV, at some point, maybe the patient's gonna get shot. And what happened in this case was, um, local government and redevelopment agencies and the lawyers that they hired uh, ran them off the cliff uh, with bad advice. And the governor and the legislature gave them a number of opportunities to settle and look for a reasonable path, but uh, there was a lot of arrogance and uh, some lawyering that was done that had unintended consequences called the court ruling, and now we're all left to suffer the effects. So at some juncture, uh, you know, post Prop 13, cities, not all, but some, decided to use the redevelopment as a way to balance the budget and to satisfy their desire to feed staff as well as uh, council salaries uh, and staff uh, for the municipal government. And that going to the cookie jar, taking out the egg money and taking out the rent money uh, got to a point where it wasn't sustainable. And now we're all left to suffer the effects. And it's sad because there are a lot of very good tools with redevelopment that were thrown out the window. And now the question is, can we demonstrate responsibility uh, in the future? And if there's a redevelopment part two or a future of that, how are those protections put in place uh, that ensure and demonstrate public trust and are done in a sustainable way? So I think that it's interesting. I think that there's plenty of blame to go around, but at some juncture, uh, the, the move that was done was required. I wish it would have happened on someone else's watch and someone else's lifetime, but it's ours now, so we'll take responsibility and find a, a good way forward. Yeah, it's too bad. There's uh, reform would have been the way to go, but now we've got a, got a dedication. So. so with that, um, why don't we turn to questions we've been getting from the audience. We've actually been getting quite a few. And so we'll start with Let's see. Terminal two, terminals two and three are not idle. Uh, terminal four is uh, terminal one is idle, and terminal four is probably on its way out as uh, as um, port priority use um, based on the, the general plan. But um, the Point Petrera Marine, Marine Terminal um, is something that again we we put a lot of infrastructure in, and then. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Jim here. Terminal 3 is, uh, is active. I think we'd like to expand um, marketing there and, and, uh, um, or expand our business opportunities there. So we're, 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 still, we're still looking. Actually, just like that microphone, you know, the commodities come and go. So, um, we've identified uh, a handful of commodity types, um, and with customers to talk with the railroads to make sure that that's a good fit. And uh, we're going to need a lot of close collaboration with the port. Um, two of them I can share; the rest I really can't share. Um, refrigerated and frozen foods and lumber are two that we're really looking at, and uh, those commodity types are primarily for transloading, and then uh, some of the bulk activity that we've, uh, or I should say oversized act activity that we've been um, contacted about is uh, large windmill uh, components that come from overseas that are too heavy and too big to put on a truck and need to be moved out on rail. And then everything else is right now kind of quiet, secret. Uh, 
Uh, I think what the question is, is geoengineering is uh, an approach to deal with climate change, uh, reducing climate change instead of re reducing the release of greenhouse gases uh, what you do is these measures where they would, for example, seed clouds so that we'd have more cloud cover that would uh, uh, reflect more light and cool the earth. And there's also another one to put, I think, um, uh, some kind of metal filings in the ocean to also uh, sequester carbon. So these are these are like engineering fixes for climate change. And I think what they're saying is, would that be a better way to go than having to adapt to the impacts of climate change? And uh, there is debate out there as to whether you can do that. But um, in talking to the scientists who are looking at this more directly, most of them say, well, do we really want to do a massive uh, field experiment with the Earth to try to deal with this problem? Uh, that could have massive unintended consequences, or do we want to just, as, as Phil was talking about, just deal with the issue, feel the pain, and get over it? And I think that's really the way to go, though uh, I can't help but add that even if we stopped releasing greenhouse gases today, we would still see more global warming and sea level rise and the need for adaptation. So even if we did geoengineering, we'd also need adaptation. It'll have no effect whatsoever. No, we, uh, that was one of the biggest issues that looked at in the uh, EIR, the transportation. And uh, we're taking several uh, measures uh, to alleviate additional uh, traffic on the Bay Bridge. Uh, one, we're putting in a, uh, a new ferry terminal that will go directly across the Bay to uh, San Francisco uh, Ferry Building. Uh, that will go in relatively early into the uh, development build out. Uh, we're expanding, uh, working with the transit agencies, and we're expanding bus service with Muni, as well as um, AC Transit, to the East Bay. So it'll be a much more uh, robust uh, bus system. Um, we're also going to be uh, doing light metering on the on-ramp. There'll be a new on-ramp onto the Bay Bridge into San Francisco, and also enforcing uh, congested congestion pricing, um, which includes uh, just uh, taking a much bigger toll if you're going to drive onto the bridge at 7.30 on a Monday morning versus uh, probably no toll on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and then lastly, we're actually in part of the HOA dues for the residents that live there, um, and maybe some of the workers, but uh, the HOA dues for the residents will include a certain amount of money that they have to pay uh, regardless for uh, essentially muni passes or transit, you know, clipper card or uh, whatever. So. Um, we hope all those things will encourage people to use public transit and not rely on their cars, especially during the uh, peak times. Okay, Bill, a question for you. Uh, regarding the 1.4 million yards surcharge, will any of the well, dredged material be used? Most likely no. Primarily due to some of the environmental issues around that. Um, it's been uh, suggested and partially studied but I think that final determinant will be based on the avail availability of other material. So that's what we're going to need to look at. Uh, question for Bill. There were many factors that led to the Lawrence Lab being selected, which was the key factor. I, you know, uh, I can't speak for them, but uh, what I would say is I mean, it really was a, a, just a mixture of, of um, factors. I think that proximity to their current campus was important. Um, the uh, a real sort of a direct transportation corridor to um, from from their existing campus to to the Richmond Field Station that was important. Um, I think the one thing that they they did indicate is that that. Uh, I mean, I, I think this was important. They were really surprised and, and very overwhelmed and ha happily so with, with um, the support from the Richmond community. And it's hard to, I, I know that other communities did the same thing, um, but they, they did make a point of saying that, that that was important. So the location, the support, and then also the, uh, the ability to 
create a complete campus. Um, they, they had room to do what they wanted to do, and also uh, they, they foresaw the ability to have amenities develop that, uh, that aren't there now, but, but will in fact complement and create that complete campus. So those are the three things that I think, um, and it's really hard to isolate one. I, I, I do think that all were important, and they were important in different ways to different people with, um, within the lab um, decision-making structure. I'll start. Um, well, I think the main difference that I see in my uh, experience over the years is that uh, there's a lot more regulatory agencies involved. Um, we're, we work with BCDC, uh, Army Corps Engineers, uh, the, uh, in our case, the Navy. Uh, so we're dealing with the feds, the state, and all the different local agencies and regional agencies. So I think that makes it more complicated, more challenging, and uh, rightfully so, because the Bay is a resource for everybody. and um, you don't want developers running roughshod over uh, that. And I, uh, what was the second part of that question? Uh, what was the relationship to the resource? Oh, uh, right. Um, so I guess it's a fuse. It's got to be part of yours. It's definitely a fuse of, uh, of uh, the bay itself, uh, certainly. Um, but yeah, we, we really are embracing the bay. It's, it's one of the features that our marketing office will be, from day one to the very end, be just pushing the bay views and uh, the access to it with uh, the, the 9, 14 miles of shoreline we're going to have out there. Um, the whole plan is to have that entire shoreline be open space, not private, private land. Uh, so everybody who wants to uh, can go take a long walk, including a part of the new Bay Trail that we're building there. Uh, that we might have to retally bill of who's got the most Bay Trail after we build this. Um, that I think, you know, it's just an obvious thing to embrace is the Bay resource. Just real brief, I'm not sure I have much to add to that. I, I think that that uh, everybody views uh, San Francisco Bay as, as public open space. That's why you have recreation, I mean, that's why you have regulatory agencies that, that uh, in, in some cases overlap. I mean, think some would suggest that maybe is why it's a more difficult regulatory climate, but, but uh, whether it's because you're next to it, because you have a view of it, because you can drive to it, because you can boat on it, because, uh, because of all the things that it is, everybody has that stake in its ownership and preservation. And um, so I think that's why anything associated with, with um, Bay development gets, again, rightfully so, uh, just really carefully scrutinized and, and uh, I think it does, I think it does require um, special planning and uh, to make sure that, that uh, it's, it's um, truly cared for. I think a lot of us have traveled around the world and feel that uh, we've seen bodies of water that aren't properly cared for. Um, I think there's a way that we can be commercially viable here, but also be good stewards of the resource. Um, so without question, we wouldn't be doing our project if the bay wasn't there, because our project is all about the bay and the deep water access. Um, but I think it needs to be said that I think it's an underutilized resource. I think uh, you heard comments earlier about uh, encouraging more ferry uh, activity on the bay uh, and encouraging that kind of transportation. Um, and I, as a regular user of the bay, three or four days a week, uh, sometimes I'm just shocked that I'm the only person, literally the only person on the bay uh, at that point in time. And it's a good feeling, uh, and I'd be maybe a little fussy if I had to be in traffic out in the bay. Like it is, uh, you know, I tend not to go on the weekends because there are sailboats out there using the bay. But during the week, it's uh, mostly a commercial operation and some ferries. So I think that uh, we're very lucky to have it, and uh, I think everyone in this room is here because they want to be good stewards of the resource. I, I just want to take uh, these clips and put it on our website because <laughs> that's beautiful. Uh, the Bay really is a different, it's a resource for all of us. 
And uh, as I think you've heard us say all through the day, uh, we realize we're a regulatory agency, we know we realize we're another layer, but we also realize we're working together and you can get benefits out of that at the end of the day when you can sell your project for more because you have public access to the shoreline, because it's a, a, a beautiful living bay. And we try to work with uh, the developers to try to make sure that there's a project that we can approve and they can live in, with and profit off the result. Okay, well thank you everybody. I want to give a big round of applause.